Church on assignment. It's often said to be a builder these days. All you need is a ute, a dog, and a loud radio. My wife's had a heart attack. We're just worried out of our brains. If I build one house that leaks in the future now, I'll be hung, drawn, and pulled. It was like living in a bomb shelter and living under tarps and really never seeing the light of day. What can New Zealand learn from British Columbia? First of all, you build a house without holes in it. Good evening. As New Zealand homeowners come to terms with living in leaky houses, tonight a warning from Canada that all houses built in this country in the last eight to ten years should be investigated. Canada's been living with its leaky house crisis for ten years. There they found homes built from monolithic cladding, weatherboard or concrete all had the potential to leak. If the Canadian experience is anything to go by, New Zealand homeowners are in for a long haul. Kerry ann Evans looks at the lessons from Canada and the way they're tackling this systemic problem now that the finger pointing has stopped. I mean, this is the worst man-made disaster I've ever seen. And nobody wants to be accountable. And that is criminal. Alice Pursuit is talking about this, Vancouver's $2 billion leaky home crisis. It's impacting on thousands of Canadians. People who have found their homes are no longer their castles. You see the, the stainage and all the signs of a problem, and you see that they're painting the exterior, uh, and you can see... It's Carmen it's Maretic is a real estate agent. See that. Yeah, it is covering it up quite nicely. Uh, but they're certainly not dealing with the building and unfortunately a lot of uh, potential buyers may not be aware that this is what they're hiding about uh, behind it. But ironically, Carmen's helping homeowners as they battle government to sort out their leaky homes. I don't believe that in a democratic capitalistic society that we should allow a small section of the uh, a sector of the population to financially benefit on the backs of people, uh, hundreds of thousands of people in this case, who've done nothing but wanted to be financially sound and, and independent. We met Alice Pursuit just hours before she was to be released from hospital. She was recovering from a bout of pneumonia brought on by stress. Alice's doctor says she can't return to her apartment. Oh, I could go to my daughter's, but that's cramped. I, I could go to my brother's, but that's not really a good. I mean, so many people say, sure, you know, come over, but it's not going to help me. And you can't go home. And I, and I don't. I, I mean, I can't. I can't go back to the apartment, for sure. So I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Alice paid $275,000 for her leaky apartment. Now she'd be lucky to get $100,000. Under tarpaulin since February, Stacky Botra's mold warnings are plastered outside. It's going to cost Alice another $70,000 for repairs. And sometimes they come in and all of a sudden they start drilling. And then there's a whole pile of dust and, and the noise and the vibration. It's, um, then you think when she, I, I've got to get out of here. But by the time lunchtime comes, you're too tired to go. You can't go. So you put in a couple of earplugs and you turn on the TV and you hope that four o'clock will come soon and I'll go home. And that's where it goes. Alice's neighbor showed us what it's like to live in a building site. 
Inside Alice's apartment, you can tell instantly what she's talking about. The windows are being replaced. There's scaffolding right outside. Everywhere, there's dust and all around a toxic glue-like smell that cloys at the back of your throat. It just puts so many down, downturns. Uh, they just, I give it up. This story could easily be a New Zealand one. Unsuspecting homeowners, leaky houses and health problems. But this is Vancouver, Canada. Here, the problem's been a headline for a decade. They've had 10 years of bankruptcies of people walking away from their homes. The growth rate has plummeted. Leaky homes have impacted on the property market. 10 years on, they're still arguing the toss over who's to blame. And back in New Zealand, the finger-pointing is well underway. What a mess. What a trail of incompetence. What a trail of incompetence and deceit over the most serious issue that hundreds of thousands of New Zealand homeowners face. But with many property owners still in denial, the true size of this crisis may never be known. Not on 40. A moisture level of 40%. 20% is the maximum acceptability in a house. This property, just six years old, is rotting from inside to out. So you could easily miss it if you didn't know what you were looking for. If you didn't know where to drill or what to look for or where to go, you'd miss it. And people miss it. They miss it regularly. <laughs> Greg O'Sullivan and his brother Philip are modern-day whistleblowers. It was their persistence that sparked the Select Committee inquiry into leaky homes. No one knows how big this problem is. We've been asking since 1999 for the size of this potential problem to be identified. We have not been listened to. Right from the start, indications this issue is contentious. Within the industry, opinion diverse. I know we've had a lot of uh, media hype about the extent of the problem, um, but certainly um, I'm not necessarily convinced it's to anything like the level that's being indicated. What are your qualifications to do this job? Well, I started off back in 1968 as an apprentice carpenter. Talk to O'Sullivan about his qualifications. He'll tell you he started as an apprentice. He's a consultant, a building surveyor, mediator and arbitrator. Because within this industry, there is criticism that you and your brother are blowing this whole thing out of proportion. No, in actual fact, I think the industry is um, understating the issue critically. And uh, it's, a, it's an extreme worry. The O'Sullivans first raised warnings and letters to the Building Industry Authority in April 1998. Initially, it was soft rot. A year later, problems in buildings less than 10 years old. Industry news in the year 2000 also targeted leaky buildings. And by November of that year, industry players had travelled to Canada to study the problem. On their return, we didn't receive a strong signal from anybody. Dr that Bill Porteous, Chief Executive of the Building Industry Authority. So in fact, are you blaming the industry for not giving you that advice? No, I'm saying that um, we, like the industry and like the territorial authorities, um, none of whom either expressed concern about uh, leaking buildings to us, um, were all caught unawares by what was unknown to us all, a developing problem. So, with no concrete facts, the BIA then tried to keep the issue in-house. It decreed there was still no need to warn the public, no need to warn unsuspecting homeowners they could have a problem on their hands. Then, in July last year, the O'Sullivan sent this letter to key industry contacts, the BIA and the Minister of Internal Affairs. That letter told George Hawkins damage could range from two to five billion dollars. They warned of litigation, of business failure, and predicted property values could be affected. I think it's fair to say that the Prendos was seen as a sort of one end in terms of, of, of the alarmists uh, in the area. But as a minister, if you'd had a letter across your desk suggesting there was two to five billion dollars worth of trouble, wouldn't that have rung bells? 
Well, you'd, you'd, you'd seek your advice from the people who are there to advise you, which is the BIA, supposedly got all the technical advice. They're telling you that that's not so. There's not a major systemic problem at all. Because first of all... Assignment repeatedly requested interviews with George the Hawkins. These uh, were declined. Technology. Instead, we were referred to Finance Minister Michael Cullen to quote a parliamentary employee. He was the one holding the checkbook. And I think at least the, the BIA should have been saying to the Minister, there are some serious questions here which, which we need to talk through and that you need to be aware of because in the end it's the duty of an organisation like that to alert a Minister to what may be a serious political problem. In retrospect, do you think you should have acted earlier? In retrospect, I think yes. Uh, but if we had known more than we knew, and at the time, we knew actually very little. And it may have been that if uh, we had been able to give advice sooner, uh, that that might have helped the situation a bit. But it wasn't until April this year, when official warnings were released and homeowners bravely started to speak out, that leaky houses made it into the news. And just last week, more evidence that the government was trying to distance itself. Helen Clark claiming the issue is nothing more than a media beat up. The seriousness of the situation appears to be a fraction of what the beat up in the New Zealand Herald implies. Given that successive ministers of internal affairs have received letters, and in particular George Hawkins, the minister, signed a letter out in August 2001, how can the minister possibly maintain in this parliament that he did not receive notice until this year? Speaker, Honourable Dr. Michael Mr. Cullen. Mr. Speaker, a good question with a good answer. Because if the member cares to read the answer prepared by the BIA, it signally fails to bring to the attention of the Minister the potential seriousness of the problems which were emerging. If George Hawkins thinks that this person here is going to get off his back, well, he's wrong. Until George Hawkins and Mr. Cullen and Helen Clark and Wayne Mapp and all the rest of the parliamentarians realise this is not a political football we're talking about here. This is real New Zealand and real facts. And if they don't stop it, it's going to get worse and worse. Would you resign? Would you consider resigning? Um, that's a difficult question to answer. Um, it's, it's not been put to me by the people who might ask me to resign. No matter where you live, Auckland, Christchurch, even Queenstown, our houses and apartments are leaking. All these house owners, there's no need for their houses to be leaking. The lies that have been told have been absolutely horrendous. There has been a massive breakdown leading to an unprecedented level of problems. The last four months, there's been a very big strain on our marriage. Many homeowners are already involved in expensive litigation. Others have settled out of court. Those checks, hundreds of thousands of dollars. I don't know about the rest of you, but I, I find that sleep's OK up till about 4 o'clock in the morning. Yes, half past one for me, half mate. Half past one. That's a good night's sleep. Just 18 months ago, this group of homeowners each paid around half a million dollars for their brand new townhouses. Today, those houses are littered with the telltale signs of moisture investigations. And it's the opinion of the person who was doing the uh, investigating that the flashing which is on the bottom of the sill of this window is totally inadequate. Instead of being a long flashing as per the plan right down over the top of that sill, it only occupies probably less than a third of it. Their report found traces of rot and stachybotrys mould. Inspectors recommended the use of treated timber and wall cavities to allow the houses to breathe. The only way to find out what's actually wrong with this is to strip the cladding right down and have a look behind. Um, it's only then that we're going to really be able to attribute blame to any particular person. Training provided by the Last the month, provider. Jim Tomic took his plight to the select committee. Problems with my chest, my wife's had a heart attack. We just worried out of our brains about what to do. The builder shut the door on us. He says it's the government's problem. 
Um, the developer got, claims he's seeking restitution from his contractors, uh, but with discussions exactly drawn out, these homeowners can't plan. I've been retired for 12 years. You've set up for your life, for, your, for a lifestyle, um, and, and that's just, just taken away from you. How much do you think your life has been put on hold because of all of this? Well, I think, really, since since we first found out, so, you know, it's six months, but the, until this is concluded, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, probably another 18 months, two years, uh, where you cannot make decisions in relation to what you want to do. When I'm here, I'm peering at the walls and thinking, now, is that crack leaking more than it did before? And it's raining today. Why am I so worried? And mm. then at night when it's raining, you worry about the water going into the walls. Mm. And staying there. <laughs> so your home is not your castle anymore, no. really. We're by no means fat cats. We've worked hard and um, we sold a very modest home in Papatoi and sold it for less than what we wanted, much less, and we moved into this thinking it was our dream home, mm -hmm. and um, it's all turned to custard. It's often said to be a build-up these days. All you need is a ute, a dog, and a loud radio. And whether builders have been in business four days or 40 years, right now, many are feeling the heat. When it comes to leaky homes, the blame mentality is rife. That was the electrician. John Barrett's been building houses for 30 years. His son Justin is a graduate of the old style apprenticeship scheme. Younger son Danny is a modern day builder. There's no formal training. He doesn't have to attend courses and pass written exams. He learns on the job with dad. I've got to read up on um, all the theory and go to dad, he'd test me on it. And yeah, basically if I get it wrong, then we go over it again, but nonetheless, it's still not clarifying it, really. Leaky houses and the lack of building inspection always gets a good airing at Smoko. We've got the second story to go, the roof trusses. This building won't be inspected again until it's closed up and the roof is on. We stand by our work, but I mean, for Joe Schmo down the road, I mean, as we just said, from this time till about five weeks down the track we could do anything in here and nobody will know so <laughs> i mean you know where's the where's the accountability for us and where's the accountability to the council at the end of the day the system used to work great years ago when you had a borough and the building inspector just drove around in a car all day they drifted around and all of a sudden you could turn up and if you were doing something wrong <laughs> They really bounced you for it. It's better to get it done right, and that way you don't have to come back in five or ten years and fix up a big balls up, basically. Getting it right is utmost on everyone's mind. Ask any child to draw a picture of a house, nine times out of ten, their homes will have eaves. How could so many adults have got it so wrong? I think that all buildings need, need to breathe and um, when, when you package them up and, and uh, you know you put on a cladding system on the outside and jib board on, on the inside and then you stuff it full of insulation then it can't breathe and that's where an awful lot of the problem occurs. Have you built leaky buildings? Uh, yes, we have, and, and, and things like everybody in, in, in the business, yeah, and, um, and, and things uh, very few. But yes, um, I'm not happy to say. Mm. So what happens in that situation? We generally fix it. It's a pretty clear legal responsibility and, um, and things so if, if, if we're at fault, we cough up. Award-winning architect Simon Carnahan says there should be no excuse for building a leaky home. Take this renovation of a home he designed 12 years ago. So we're just really adding on to this plaster system. As you can see, it's in pretty good nick for that sort of length of time. There's no cracks in here whatsoever. If you look here, Kerry, it's got a, it's got a casing bead on the bottom. And if you just put your fingers up underneath here, you'll notice that there's, there's an air gap. Carnahan says on, uh, these days everyone wants homes designed here. in a hurry. Things that the joinery is set down so it's in a, in a recess and, and uh, there's a sill flashing underneath here. And he says town planning constraints and a lack of qualified people has put pressure on an already underperforming industry. 
you need time to think things out, you need time to develop drawings, you need time to develop ideas, you need time to be technically competent. It just doesn't happen in five minutes. When you say that, I'm thinking money, expense. Time is, is money, and that is, is again the, the problem. Uh, a lot of people see buildings as commodities, um, like a kilo of, of butter. It's, it's a commodity that they can sell, and, and they want to get it up built as quickly as they can, as cheaply as, as, as they can. Um, it's, a, it's a business deal. The fundamental problem is the standards are too low. The standards should have been up here, they're down here. Developer Tim Manning admits he's built leaky homes. He also owns a number of properties in his developments. This year, the cost of remedials far worse than any time in the past. I haven't wound my company up. I haven't, I've had the same phone number for 14 years. I haven't gone to Aussie. And if you look around the marketplace, there's a lot that just jumps ship saying, this is too hard, make more money over there. Essentially, as a developer, we're a facilitator. We, we didn't actually hold a hammer or saw and build the thing. We, um, we, we got an architect, an engineer, a builder, and we facilitated the thing to be built. So we're actually going in there working with them to facilitate, to get these people around the table to hopefully get a resolution to move it ahead. Another thing, Carnahan says there's too much reliance on sealants. He tells the story of turning up to inspect a multi-storey building. It was pouring with rain and builders were pouring sealants into window flashings. So now I had a look in the, in the jumbo bin and there are about 10 different sorts of sealants, none of them that would do the job properly, none of them which was specified. So all I could do was write, write to that, uh, that, that particular developer uh, and tell him I never got another job. But, you know, I pointed, pointed it out, that building since legs. Having built spec homes for 20 years, John Barrett is making a slight market shift. He uses H3 treated timber. He's also adding a weatherboard to plaster designed homes in response to consumer demand. Mainly that one, that one and that one to um, weatherboards just so that the public will feel a little bit more reassured. And selling houses off the plans is now a no-go. I want the public to see that house as a as a finished product that's well built and all the systems that are used in it we're comfortable with knowing that any um, any possible moisture issues are dealt with had we sold off the plan um, say just take this house here with with plaster and had we gone along with the architect's original idea at the end of the day it may become unsaleable some architects and builders stipulate treated timber, but within the industry, opinion is divided over its effectiveness. Both Carter Holt and Fletcher Forrest lobbied the government to bring in kiln-dried timber. Fletcher's warned the select committee, turning back the clock will cost. Treating timber will add significant complexity and therefore cost through a number of stages of the supply chain to the building industry. That cost must be passed on to homeowners, and yet it will not provide any impact on the weather tightness of those buildings. With our industry at odds, what's happening in Canada? You can't point the finger just at the architect, just at the developer. Engineer the Marcus developer. Dell is one parties. of Vancouver's leading like building here, science specialists. The sort of outcome His company there. repairs leaky buildings, and Dell says when it comes to leaks and rot, it's an issue of minimizing risk. Uh, all of the exterior elements are, are balcony structures now where we think there's a higher probability of water ingress. We are reconstructing them with pressure treated wood. So that is treated wood, like treated H3? Wood. Well, actually, the materials we're using here are a borate treatment. It's, uh, it's a type of preservative that we're told is relatively environmentally friendly. Would it surprise you that we no longer use treated timber in New Zealand? We've heard that. I haven't seen it firsthand, but I've heard they've stopped using pressure treated wood. Wise mode? I think you can actually, if you design properly, you can get away with using regular wood, untreated wood. But if you've got a risk of water getting in, the use of pressure treated wood is, is not a bad idea. Up next, we're still in Canada where they're still living with leaky homes 10 years on.
Well, when we bought our condo in 1991, it was beautiful on the outside, and then we opened it up. It was rotten, thoroughly rotten. Vancouver, Canada. It's temperate climate similar to New Zealand. And like this country, its problems with leaky homes is legendary. Water's been getting into the structure and has caused some very significant deterioration, as we can see in these areas. The wood actually has almost a burnt look. From a distance, this tranquil setting belies the rot beneath. This leaky apartment block is just 12 years old and undergoing a $2.2 million refit. Each owner faces a repair bill of $70,000. As you can see, it's completely rotten off, so we've had to put the temporary shoring in there. Frightening to believe that this is just 12 years old. Yes. We, we see it quite commonly here. We get maybe a little bit uh, complacent about it because we've seen so much of it now. But uh, it is... It is it, uh, frightening when you consider people were using those balconies just a few months before we shut them down. In fact, you don't have to go far in this city to find someone living in a leaky home. It was like living in a bomb shelter for nearly a year. You were walking through plywood corridors and living under tarps and really never seeing the light of day and uh, living with the idea that workers and strangers were coming in and out of your house at all times in the morning and taking out your bedroom windows, having no curtains. We have newspapers for blinds taped to all of our windows for privacy. With her baby due in January, Cheryl hopes to be rid of the chaos by Christmas. At the end of the day, the uh, homeowner is left with a tab, which is quite significant. How much is it going to cost you at the end of the day? Well, we've had to come up with um, about $51,000, just ourselves, our unit. They're saying now they're over budget and they're delayed. So it's probably going to be another ten or fifteen thousand dollars. What we have found here in Canada is that it doesn't matter whether you live in an apartment, a high rise or a house, all buildings are being affected. And while you can go to mediation, that process is long and drawn out. If you're lucky enough to track down your builder or developer, chances are their companies no longer exist. And as for local government, it's been quick to legislate itself out of any liability. If Ford didn't put brakes on a vehicle, I think you could knock on their door and say, listen, uh, we got to talk, but not in this industry. You know, and there's hundreds of millions of property here, you know, and there's, there's no one watching. There's no, there's no one, no one cares. That's, that's the biggest thing, no one cares. Sandra and Gary Fee's brand new apartment leaked. Mold was found in the walls. They spent months shrouded in scaffolding. Then things got worse. Their son, Brendan, now four, needed a nebulizer to help him breathe. They blame the building. And every night, we would, uh, we would, we would have to uh, get him to breathe that way. And, it, and it's just, just a horrible, horrible feeling as new parents to watch, you know, a child can't breathe. I just, I just can't describe it, and I think that's the most painful part of this whole situation. Once we moved out of the condo, his symptoms cleared up and we never had to use the machine again. They bought their apartment for $170,000, spent $20,000 on repairs and eventually sold it for $155,000. At this stage in your life, you're a young couple, what's it like to lose $40,000 on property? So I started working six days a week to pay off, uh, to pay off loans and the bills just kept coming. And sooner or later, you wonder, from the beginning, should I have just handed back the keys? Why wasn't I on top of it? You know, there's deadly mold in the wall. Somebody knew it. No one said a thing. Somebody knew the place was leaking, and everybody gets to walk away, except your child. And he becomes a victim of what? My poor judgment? It felt like there was cancer in my building. I was a victim of something I didn't know what I was getting into. School teacher Jennifer Bird once prided herself on being a go-getter. She was fit and on top of her game. So when you see something like this, what goes through your mind? Uh, I can look at it for a few minutes and then I have to walk away. <laughs> right from the start, Jennifer's dream home leaked. Rot and stacky mould was rife. 
I had to make an intelligent decision. I couldn't follow like a bunch of sheep living here, getting sick. I had to make a decision for my health. Facing bankruptcy, Jennifer took her doctor's advice and walked away from her leaky home. It was devastating. It was um, painful. It was um, almost unbelievable that it was even happening. I still feel like it was a bad nightmare and still is. The nightmare is not over. It was devastating. I had to, I flew home, home to my parents in Ontario. Fell, I fell on their floor crying. They didn't know what to do with me. They've never seen me like this. And then you got sick. I got real sick. I got physically sick. I got emotionally sick and I had to stop working. This 44-year-old is now on a full regime of medication. We know that mold can kill good cells, blood cells, and uh, there seems to be some coincidence that many of these buildings with mold problems, there tends to be uh, folks that had previously had cancers, have their cancers reoccur. Well, when we bought our condo in 1991, it was beautiful on the outside, and then we opened it up. It was rotten, thoroughly rotten, and it cost me $161,000 to fix it and make it look like it looks now. Former academic James Balderson heads up Colco, a group helping homeowners battle the minefield of repairing leaky homes. Hi, Mary. Hi, James. Welcome to my rotten, leaky condo. Here I am. Ten years on, they're oh, still you. dealing with the crisis. It's just a stopgap, and it isn't cheap either, this epoxy. Mm -hmm. James is joined on Colco well, by I, Rudy I, Elman, a retired builder. Rudy's also having problems with his apartment. The original contract was in the neighborhood, I believe, of 450 some odd thousand dollars. Because of these extras, I understand we are up to 580,000, and as you can see, we don't even have the bloody stucco off a of part of the building. Throughout the 80s and 90s, developers encouraged by city planners began using Californian-style designs. Stucco and plaster was everywhere. Devoid of overhangs, buildings got taller and more exposed to the elements. The basics of building gave way to the glamour of design and lifestyle marketing. There were problems with uh, inappropriate use of materials, uh, poor detailing and lack of detailing, poor trade practices and lack of, uh, uh, of, of trade practice in the right area, and it became a, really a systemic problem. In the mid-90s, after being inundated with leaky apartment buildings, the government of British Columbia commissioned an inquiry. The Barrett Report recommended the creation of a home protection office. This provides interest-free loans to fix leaky buildings. It forced builders to be registered and instituted a best practices building guide to clean up the industry. It was set up to restore confidence in the industry. There should have been no confidence in the industry, none whatsoever until they learn to build condos that don't leak and rot. But houses and apartments and condos have always leaked. If they had told me that my new home was going to leak and rot, I would never have bought it. They're just uh, another pile of BS, that's all it is, uh, brainwashing uh, a lot of these senior citizens. Uh, this is basically the last place that they think they're going to lay their heads down and then they become involved in a war zone for a couple of years and legal battles and financial ruin and health problems. And this is what you call retirement. The Barrett investigation triggered studies which showed up to 50% of houses built between 1985 and 95 leaked. This includes schools which are now facing up to $100 million in repairs. At the University of British Columbia, there's now ongoing research into how to stop homes leaking. We have to accept the fact that uh, we're human and there will be uh, defects in our construction and we have to plan for that. In Vancouver, new design and repair work has to be scrutinized by specialists. 
Homes once built with solid wall construction now must contain a cavity to deflect and drain moisture. Builders are encouraged to use thicker wall linings and overhangs. We know that we'll never produce a perfectly leak-free building. Uh, what we want to do is produce buildings that last certainly the length of the mortgage and more like a, a wood frame building should last 80 or 100 years and uh, serve the residents uh, uh, appropriately. Can you guarantee that this building is not going to leak after you've fixed it? Guarantee is a very strong word. We have fairly good evidence that the rain screen system in conjunction with uh, properly detailed construction will work. You'll see on some of our re rehabilitation jobs, we actually are adding overhangs and so forth to try and protect the walls from rainfall. So Up next, you know, Kiwis react to the lessons thought, well, from Canada. I'm totally devastated. I'm actually worse than I was before I had my heart attack. <laughs> like living in a bomb shelter. In a bid to sheet home to New Zealanders the impact of living with a leaky building, we got our group of homeowners to look at the way Canadians handle the problem. For almost a year now, not having access to your patio. Rosemary and Gordon Vile are already coming to terms with moving out of their home. We've had a quote as far as storing furniture, etc. And uh, some members of the family are going to have to put up with this for a while. <laughs> But for others, the images from Canada came as a shock. I'm totally devastated. I'm actually worse than I was before I had my heart attack. <laughs> I really feel upset. I'm really, really upset. Um, I hadn't gone as far as thinking about having to move out. Jim and I both said that we were going to stick it out of home. But I don't think we can. No, um, no. I just don't think we can, we can do it, and I don't think we can afford accommodation. That's just another expense that we hadn't even mm. thought about. I'm just totally gutted. Mm -hmm. I think that I pushed him into buying this home. I feel <laughs> terrible. I feel like it's all my fault. But, 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 but you mustn't feel like that because, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we bought them because they were new and they looked and lovely and, maintenance and you know, free. maintenance free. And In regards to the mould, are you referring to the, the outside of your home, the exterior? Still unaware of the size of the problem, our government has set up a mediation and adjudication program to help homeowners seek compensation for their leaky homes. The address is all one word. So far, around 500 people have registered. It'll fast track the time it takes to deal with libel parties. Is anybody ever going to put their hand up? At the These homeowners know they'll have to bear the, uh, some of the cost of repair. People. Gordon Vile has faith in the mediation process. Others doubt its effectiveness. The only way that's ever going to be resolved is if the building is completely stripped and each one of these people is brought to task and say, well, look, this is your bit here. There's where the leaks were. That's, that was caused by this, that, and the other. Now, how an arbitrator or a, or a mediator sitting around a table in his collar and tie is ever going to establish who's to blame, I don't know. It'll end up being a huge bun fight and people are just going to walk away. With leaky houses taxing the government, it's also got builders embroiled in the debate. Everyone's so scared of it. If we can make a house breathe, and we go back to using more flashings where possible instead of silicon sealants or any type of sealant, let's get back to basics. As professional chippies, these men say there's more to building than just hammers and nails. They're concerned at the fragmentation of the industry and varying standards of quality. They say builders should be registered. Plumbers, gas fitters, electricians, these people are all registered. You should be a qualified carpenter after 8,000 hours. You should have built three or four homes and been viewed by your peers and an independent body before you then get a registration as a builder and even that should be checked each year by again somebody independent. Simon Carnahan agrees. He says if it's good enough for architects to train for five years, it's good enough to register builders. Every player in the building industry should be registered in some way and, and uh, they should, should be registered so that they're legally responsible as well. They can't walk away from things. They can't uh, close up 
shop or close their, their, their companies and walk away from things. You've got to be careful of not jumping in with one set of regulations, which then impact upon appropriate commercial arrangements elsewhere. I think it's where it's a device to avoid legal liability. That's the issue the government has to make absolutely sure uh, that we've got that tied down as tightly as we can when we're coming on to the longer range uh, solutions to the problems. The government's promising a major overhaul of our building laws next year. Expect to see the words fit for purpose inserted into legislation and everyone from architects to inspectors will be looked at. Builders will be registered. It's only those bits up there that yeah. we're, we're waiting for. Yeah. Shashi Sawney is building his dream home here in Newmarket. So once the scaffoldings are properly done, then probably they come back. How do you want it? Such is the state of the industry. He now pays John Barrett $85 an hour to quality control building standards on his $600,000 project. I don't want to land up in the problem after I move in and the house is leaking or dripping from somewhere, although it looked nice. I don't want, that's the last thing I never want to happen. I mean, I don't really rely on what council inspections are. That is just like a stage or, or the, you know, the process we have to go through. If somebody buys something off me, they come back to Taradol or Tim Manning saying, does it leak? And I can say, well, the government says it doesn't. That's not going to wash anymore. I've got to actually have more certainty, so I'm taking control of that process. So effectively, you're double-checking the government? Absolutely have to. I cannot rely on them anymore. Because if, if I build one house that leaks in the future now, I'll be hung, drawn and quartered. Tim, Kerry Ann Evans, Kerry, Television yeah. New Zealand. Yeah. Fancy seeing you here. Yeah, same man. <laughs> Quite by chance, we bumped into Tim Manning in Canada. He too was seeking answers. Yeah. He's uh, very informed. It's been a great, great meeting. Yeah. And we, we're looking at home, uh, well, high-rises, condos, and now single-family homes as well, aren't we, Don? Yeah, the raindrops don't know the difference. They, uh, <laughs> they just find a place to get in, and they get in. It doesn't matter whether it's low-rise, high-rise, mid-rise, single-family, multi-family. Uh, they don't care. Learning from past mistakes, Manning says he's bringing quality control in-house. Future projects have been redesigned using treated timber, and there'll be no internal balconies. Most of the developers on this problem are um, putting it under the carpet. As I mentioned before, there's a problem, uh, we'll just quietly, you know, either ignore it or fix it or hope it goes away. Um, it won't go away. It'll get bigger, and the sooner they address it, the sooner they pop out the other side. One leaky rotten condo and you're finished. Don't buy a leaker. With this issue now in its 10th year in Canada, Leaky home fatigue like has set in. These protests no longer attract onlookers, let alone media coverage. What can New Zealand learn from British Columbia? Oh, much, much. First of all, you build a house without holes in it. The sooner they get to the essence of the problem and help the people involved, the better. And the better for the construction industry and all those people who want to buy a safe, warm house in New Zealand. We try to live the lifestyle. We at the top the end, about. Simon so Carnahan quotes buildings at around three to four thousand dollars a square meter. Compare that to twelve to fourteen hundred dollars at the lower end, and either end, that safe, warm house will cost more. All of this is going to mean that buildings become more expensive and perhaps fewer, fewer people can afford to own buildings. And of course that may also include some form of compulsory insurance. We've yet to tease through those issues and make final decisions. Now that will be built into the cost of, of a new house. So you know, there's no point in trying to, to hide those facts. For those homeowners still in denial, the Canadians have some advice. Get your properties checked. They say every house built since 1995 should be investigated. You really should do some due diligence property management and investigate uh, areas that uh, could be high risk areas uh, because of the cost of remediation will be uh, quite a bit lower if you catch problems early on. So people who live in stucco buildings who've been built since 1995 should have them investigated? Not necessarily stucco. Um, again, that was one of those silver bullet issues that people thought if it's a stucco building, it's a problem. Uh, we found that uh, stucco, wood siding, vinyl siding, they were all leaking. 
Uh, it doesn't really matter what the cladding is. And the lessons from Canada continue. The sooner homeowners admit they have problems, the sooner they're repaired, and the sooner they're free to move on with their lives. Kerry Ann Evans with that report. You'll remember one of the homeowners in our story, Jim Tomek. Well, just last year, he paid $480,000 for his brand new home. This week, the quote he got to fix it was $99,000. We'll be back in a moment. That's our program for tonight and indeed the last of our series for the year. Assignment will be back early in the new year. Until then, good night and have a safe and happy Christmas.